Tonight, I want you to take your Bibles. We're going to be in two different books of the Bible tonight. I'm going to give you the second one first. Jeremiah chapter 40. Jeremiah chapter 40. If you would go ahead and find that and put a marker there. Jeremiah chapter 40. I'll give you a minute or two to find it before I give you the next one. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. One of the major prophets right after the book of Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Jeremiah chapter 40. Got your marker there? All right, now turn the New Testament to the epistle of James. Right after the book of Hebrews, toward the very end of the New Testament, James chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse 5. Before we read, let me share with you that most of chapter 1 deals with how to face trials, tribulations, and temptations. Problems. What do you do with problems, right? And beginning in chapter 1, verse 5, we're going to learn about how to pray for wisdom for trials, tribulations, and problems. But before we read that, I want us to read from James chapter 4, verse 13. James chapter 4, verse 13. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, Spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. For as you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. How do you know if it's the Lord's will to move to another city? How do you know if it's the Lord's will to take another job? How do you know, how do you make that decision in prayer? How do you pray and find the will of God when you need to make a decision? The exact same things that are taught in chapter 1 in regard to trials and tribulations and problems, still work with how do you make a good decision? How do you make not only a good decision, how do you make the decision God wants you to make? So look at chapter 1, verse 5. Talking to believers. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, for he's a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. So what do you do to ask in faith for wisdom? How do you go about asking in faith for wisdom when you're facing a serious problem or when there's a decision that you need to make? How do you ask in faith? First thing, let him ask of God. As a pastor, it was my experience, and I suppose, I think very strongly, Brother Michael's probably seen this as well, that many times when people need to make a decision or when people are facing a difficult problem, they want to ask everybody under the sun for advice. They'll go to every church member they can find, and when they get through with all the church members, they start going to lost people. 
I have never in my life understood why any child of God would go to an unbeliever to talk about making a decision that God could help them with. Isn't that right? Who are we supposed to ask for advice? The first person we're to go to is God. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. That's simple, isn't it? That's so simple, it's like we ought to be hit by two before, right? Between our eyes, that it's so simple. So when you are needing wisdom to make a decision, the person you go to is God. And how do you go to God? You go to God in prayer. Now, in this first verse that we read here, there are three promises. Did you see the three promises? If you ask God, God gives you these three promises if you ask God for wisdom. So it says again in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally to all, without reproach, and it will be given him. Let's take him in reverse order. If you ask God for wisdom, it will be given to you. That is a categorical statement. If you're a child of God and you ask God for wisdom, God will give it to you with only one requirement. We'll get that in a few moments. But it is something that God says, I'll give it to you. Now, you can ask God for a million dollars, and He may not give it to you, right? You can ask God for a new car. He may not give it to you. You can ask God for this or for that. He may say yes, he may say no, he may say wait a while, but when you ask for wisdom, categorically God says, if you will ask in faith for wisdom, you will get all the wisdom. In fact, not only will I give you wisdom, it will be given you, but notice what else it says in this verse. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally, without reproach, it will be given him. It will be given liberally. Now, Brother Michael's conservative. I'm conservative. I don't know if you are or not. It doesn't matter. That's when you and God. God's a liberal when it comes to giving. Do you know that? God is a liberal when it comes to giving wisdom. He gives generously. He gives abundantly. He doesn't give you enough wisdom just to eke by. When God gives wisdom, He gives plenty. Press down. Push together. Running over the top of the basket. He gives liberally. So, first promise is, if you ask for wisdom and faith, God is going to give it. Second thing is, He's not only going to give you just some, He's going to give you more than you need. I like that. Thirdly, He's going to give it, the King James Version says, and He upbraideth not. How long has it been since you upbraided anybody? Did you ever upbraid anybody? has nothing to do with their hair. If you upbraid them, you make fun of them. You scorn them. You mock them. God will never do this to you. Well, I've been waiting for years for you to come to me for wisdom. I see you finally got to a place where you turned the right source. Man, if you'd just come to me sooner, think of all the problems you would have saved. Yeah, I'll give you wisdom. God won't do that to you. He loves you. He's glad when you come to Him for wisdom. Is there anything too hard for God? 
No. Is there anything he does not understand? Isn't he the all-powerful, all-wise, all-knowing God? He is. And he's the loving God. And when you come to God for wisdom, you can count on it. He has the wisdom you need. He said, but this is detailed. This is one of those things, I mean, this really gets convoluted. This gets complex. (laughs) Not to God, it doesn't. It may be really complex to me, but it's not complex to God. He sees right through all the snags. He knows exactly the wisdom we need. Now, what do we do? We ask God three promises. He'll give it. He'll give it liberally. He won't mock us or make fun of us, right? One condition. Here's the rub. Here's where people stub their toes. Right here. You can do this. Once you understand this, you're going to see you can do this. You're a child of God. You absolutely can do this. Notice what he says. He says in verse 6, But let him ask in faith, nothing doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven, tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. And many of us think, you know, my faith is just not as good as other people's faith. I don't know how to ask for wisdom and faith like that. This is the most important part of this message. So don't miss this. I'll we'll give an illustration from my own life. Just before COVID, a few months before COVID starts hitting, I had been doing something that was not very wise. A few years ago, doctors discovered that I have, they knew I had a hiatal hernia, but I was losing blood somewhere, and they didn't know where I was losing blood. And so I go to Big Baylor Hospital in Dallas, Texas, and they ran a brand new test on me. I got to be one of the, the ones that were the guinea pigs. They started with this test. And they found out that I have a condition called Cameron's lesions. Have you ever heard of Cameron's lesions? It was totally new to me too. I had never heard that in my life, but I've got it. All right? Now, Cameron's lesions is very simple to understand. I have this hiatal hernia, and there's some folds in that hiatal hernia. And underneath those folds... In that hiatal hernia, I have these tiny little ulcers. They're small, minute ulcers that go up and down that hiatal hernia. But they're under those folds. And so you never know when those little ulcers are going to start bleeding. So some days they bleed, and some days they don't bleed but I never know which. And they told me, they said, Mike, there's really no cure, but we've got good news. I said, well, tell me the good news. They said, all you have to do to handle your Cameron's lesions is you have to take an iron pill every day so that your body will produce enough blood to counteract the blood that you lose. Well, that's pretty simple, isn't it? So I started taking iron pills every day. After a couple, three years, taking iron pills every day, I got tired of it. I thought, I'm doing all right. I think I'll cut this back to one every other day. So I started taking my iron pills every other day. I think I'm doing all right. 
After a while, I got to think, you know, I must be healed or something because I feel all right. I think I'll cut this down to one every three days. And a few months later, I was doing one a week. Is there any wisdom there? So I go in for my annual physical. Go in, doc says, how you doing? I, I said, I think I'm doing pretty good. I'm getting a little tired, but I'm doing okay. He does the physical. He sends me over to do my blood work. He said, we'll send your results from your blood work over to you tomorrow. I said, good. So I go home. Eight o'clock in the morning, next morning, I get a phone call from the doctor's nurse. She says, Mr. Taylor, are you okay? Well, sure I'm okay. We want you to go directly to the emergency room. You pick the hospital, any hospital you want to, go directly to the emergency room, tell them you need a blood transfusion, and we'll call the hospital and tell them you need a blood transfusion immediately. You're abnormally low on blood. So I go, and I get two units of blood. They don't tell you this when you go for a transfusion. When you go for a transfusion, they don't fill you back up with all you've lost. If they give you the full amount of blood that you're low, your body won't produce it on its own, so they just give you enough to jumpstart you so your body will start producing the blood again. And they make you spend the night, too. Boy, I hated that. <laughs> Hadn't been in the hospital for years. Well, I go home. And I'm weak. And they've told me I'm weak, so I really know I'm weak. You know how we are. Well, the problem is, I've got a Bible conference coming up. And I'm not feeling very good. And I need to know, you know, this is like on Saturday, and I've got to leave the next Saturday to drive to the place where I'm going to do my next Bible conference. And I've just had this transfusion, and I'm weak, and I don't know if I'm healthy enough to go or not. What am I going to do? How do I have the wisdom? Should I be wise and call that pastor? You know, he's expecting me to show up, so he probably doesn't have a sermon ready for Sunday, right? Because this is his chance to wait a week. And so I, I need to give him enough time to get a sermon ready if I'm not going to be there. So I said, how am I going to figure? And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says to me, what did you tell all the people that came to you looking for wisdom? James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. I said, Lord, that's right. I preached that for years. I taught that to people for years in counseling. I need to use James 1, 5 through 8. So what have I got to do? How do I ask the Lord for wisdom in faith, I at the latest, at the very latest, I need to be able to tell that pastor on Friday that I'm not coming. I've got, I need that wisdom by Friday, right? So here's my prayer. Lord, I don't know if I should go to that Bible conference or not. I don't know if I'm healthy enough to go. I don't know if I have trouble driving there. I don't know how strong I'll be to preach. Do I need to stay home? Do I need to go? Lord, I trust You to tell me which. Because I don't know. And Lord, I need to know, not I want to know, I need to know by Friday so I can let the pastor know if I'm not coming. Right? Here's what asking in faith is. 
asking in faith is trusting the Lord to give you a clear answer in due time. Can I say that again? Asking in faith is not some supernatural big deal you do inside of you. Asking God in faith is simply going to God and telling the Lord, I am trusting you, Lord, to tell me, should I go? Should I stay? Should I move to that city? Should I take that job? And Lord, here's the time I need to know by. If you don't have a deadline you need to know by, then you leave the deadline up to God and you just wait till God tells you. But most of the time there's a deadline. It's easier when you got a deadline, right? So, I pray, James 1, 5, Lord, I'm asking you in faith, show me, should I go or stay? On Tuesday, that next week, I got to feeling really bad. I mean, I just lost all my energy. My mind wasn't working clear. And I started to say to myself, why wait till Friday? Just go ahead and call that pastor and tell him you're not coming. And the Holy Spirit said, what did you pray? Did you say you would trust God to give you an answer? Are you going to jump ahead of God and make a decision without God telling you what to do? And I said, Lord, forgive me. I'll wait on the Lord to tell me. Thursday, unexpected time. I just had this peace come over my body. And it's like the Holy Spirit said, go. Go. And I said, thank you, Lord. And the decision was made. I felt great when I got there. And I would have missed the blessing of the Bible conference if I had listened to my own feelings. God's Spirit will let you know somehow. He may let you know differently than He lets me know, but when you ask in faith, God's Spirit will let you know, and God is never a minute late. He may take you right up to the brink, but He will give you the answer in time for you to use it, because He's God and He loves you and He knows what you need. And He's promised, if you ask in faith, I will give it to you in time to use it. So asking in faith is merely trusting God to give you the right answer in time for it to be used. Now does that make sense? Nobody ever explained that to me. I thought it was just, how do you do that in faith? That's how it works. Okay, are you with me? Now, there's this marvelous passage over in the book of Jeremiah that ties into this passage. I don't know if you've ever put these two passages together or not, but I think by the time we get through with this, you're going to see how these two passages go together, and it adds something that's very important to what James has to say. So Jeremiah chapter 40 as you're turning to chapter 40, we'll start in verse 1. Let me give you the background. Jeremiah prophesied many of his sermons were against the sinfulness of God's people. And he said, God's going to destroy Jerusalem because you're unfaithful to God. And so in the year 587, the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, he comes up to the walls of Jerusalem and he starts a siege and lasts for more than a year. So in 586 B.C., the Babylonians break down the walls of Jerusalem and they capture King Zedekiah. And what do they do to Zedekiah? They take him out, 
They bring his sons in front. He was trying to escape through the countryside. He slipped out a hole in the wall, and they track him down, and they bring his sons, and right in front of his eyes, they kill all of his sons, and then they put his eyes out. They gouge his eyes out, so the last thing he would ever see was the death of his sons. Then they put him in chains with all the other prisoners of war, and they make him walk all the way back to Babylon and put him in prison. Why? Because he wouldn't obey God. He wouldn't lead God's people to obey God. Well, the Babylonians take over. Jeremiah is in chains in the same line. Notice what happens. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. After Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, that's a Babylonian captain of the guard, had let him go from Ramah when he had taken him bound in chains among all who were carried away captive from Jerusalem and Judah who were carried away captive to Babylon. Nebuzaradan came up to Jeremiah in the line and he took his key and he unlocked the chains for Jeremiah. How did he know to do that? Daniel. Daniel had been reading the prophecies of Jeremiah, and Daniel was Nebuchadnezzar's right-hand man, and Daniel told them that when you get back to Judah, there's one man that needs to go free. That's God's great prophet Jeremiah. And Nebuchadnezzar believed Daniel, and they do this. It says in verse 2, Captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God has pronounced the doom. How do you know that? Daniel told him. They heard from Daniel. Now the Lord has brought it and done just as he said, because you people sinned against the Lord, have not obeyed his voice, therefore this thing has come upon you. Now look, I free you this day from the chains that were upon you. And now look, I... that were on your hand. If it seems good to you to come with me to Babylon, come, and I'll look after you. But if it seems wrong for you to come with me to Babylon, remain here. See all the lands before you. Wherever it seems good or convenient for you to go, go there. Now while Jeremiah had not yet gone back, Nebuchadnezzar said, Go back to Gedaliah, the son of Hikam, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon has made governor over the cities of Judah. Why would Nebuchadnezzar make Shaphan's grandson the governor to take care of the Jews that were left behind that didn't go to Babylon. Well, if you want to study the life of Shaphan and his sons and his grandsons, great study. Shaphan is a great man of God. Two of Shaphan's sons saved Jeremiah's life when they tried to kill him. This grandson is a godly man. How does he get appointed governor? Daniel knows about Shaphan, and I think Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, and they wanted a man they could trust, so they got a man to love God. So they say, go to Shaphan's grandson, and it says this. His name's Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon has made governor over the city of Judah, dwell with him among the people, or go wherever it seems convenient for you to go. So the captain guard gave him rations and a gift and let him go. Then Jeremiah went to get Eli, the son of Ahikam, to Mizpah, and dwelt with him among the people who were left in the land. Jerusalem's in rubbles. He can't rule there as governor. So he chooses the city, the town of Mizpah, and Jeremiah goes there, and he knows. This man loves God. He'll protect Jeremiah. Go over to verse 13. Verse 13. Moreover, Johanan the son of Koreah and all the captains of the forces that were in the fields came to get at Mizpah. Now, there were soldiers who were not inside the walls of Jerusalem when it was torn down. They were out in the wilderness hiding and fighting when they could and trying to keep from being captured. So after the Babylonians left, here these small bands of Jewish soldiers come up to Gedaliah 
And they want him to know that they're on his side and they'll be with him. So notice what happens. They said to him, Do you certainly know that Balas, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to murder you? That's a Jew. He was related. He was a nephew of the king that had his eyes put out. So he doesn't like the fact that no relative of King Zedekiah got to be the governor. Instead, the governor is somebody that wasn't of royal lineage. And he's getting paid off by an Ammonite king who hates the Jews. So he's going to assassinate Gedaliah if he can. And Johanan's heard about this. And he tells him, but it says, Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, did not believe them. Then Johanan, the son of Korea, spoke secretly to Gedaliah and Mizpah, saying, Let me go, please, and I will kill Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and no one will know it. He's going to try to murder you. Let me kill him first. Just, just keep quiet. I'll do it for you. <laughs> Why should he murder you so all the Jews who are gathered to you would be scattered and the remnant of Judah perish? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, said to Johanan, the son of Korea, You shall not do this thing. For you speak falsely concerning Ishmael. He did not have the wisdom to know that a man he thought was his friend was going to be hired to kill him. Well, if you read chapter 41, the next thing that happens is Ishmael's son Nethaniah murders Gedaliah. And when he murders Gedaliah, he starts cross country. And he kills the soldiers that were there protecting Gedaliah, but the people that were under their care there, the wives and the daughters and the people like Jeremiah and his scribe Baruch, Nethaniah takes them prisoner of war, and he starts over to Ammon to get paid by Balas, king of Ammon. And then Johanan, the son of Kareah, is told about it, and so Johanan brings his soldiers in, and they chase down... Wouldn't this make a good movie? They chase down Ishmael, the son of Balas, and they kill some of them, but Ishmael gets away, but they get all the people that were taken prisoner of war. That includes Jeremiah. And they bring them back, and they stop at Bethlehem because they're wanting to go to Egypt. They figure since the Babylonian representative of the Jews that was governor got murdered, they think that Nebuchadnezzar may come back and wipe them out. So they got in mind they're going to go to Egypt. All right. Now we get the part that goes to James. Are you ready? Chapter 42, verse 1. Now all the captains of the forces, Johanan the son of Korea, Jezaniah the son of Hoshiah, all the people from the least to the greatest came near. They said to Jeremiah the prophet, Please, let our petition be acceptable to you. Pray for us to the Lord your God, for all this remnant since we are left, but a few as many as you can see, that the Lord your God will show us the way that we should walk and the thing we should do. We need wisdom. We need to know, should we stay here and trust Nebuchadnezzar, or should we go to Egypt and trust Pharaoh? We need wisdom from God. Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard, indeed, I will pray to the Lord your God. He's not just my God, he's your God. I will pray the Lord your God according to your words, and it shall be that whatever the Lord answers you, I will declare to you, I will keep nothing back from you. He said, when God gives me the answer, I'm going to tell you every word God says. So what have they done? They have asked for wisdom, and now they're going to wait for the answer. Does that sound like James 1? Yeah. And here's what they say. So they said to Jeremiah, Let the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not do according to everything which the Lord your God sends us by you, whether it's pleasing or displeasing, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send you that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. 
Now that's not in James. They added this. Whatever wisdom God gives us, we're going to obey it. Now I want to say to you, when you pray for wisdom, God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And when God gives you wisdom for your problem, when God gives you wisdom for making that decision, God's wisdom may not be what you thought it was going to be. Right? It's better than what you thought it was going to be. He knows exactly what's needed, and He will give you the right wisdom, but it may be unexpected wisdom. So when you ask God for wisdom, don't just ask for it in faith, and don't just wait for it to come in faith. Have your mind made up that when God gives you the wisdom, you will obey the wisdom you would be better off to never ask for the wisdom than for God to give you the wisdom and you not obey it. Right? So what have they said they're going to do? We're going to do it. Whether it's pleasing or unpleasing. Whether it's what we expect or not. Verse 7. And it happened after ten days that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. God gave his answer. He called Johanan, son of Korea, all the captains of the forces which were with him, all the people from the least, even on the greatest. He said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your petition before him. If you will still remain in this land, then I will build you and not pull you up, pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I relent concerning the disaster I brought upon you. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you're afraid. Do not be afraid of him, says the Lord. For I'm with you to save you and deliver you from his hand. I will show you mercy, that he will have mercy on you and cause you to return on your own land. Is that pretty clear? What's God's wisdom? Don't go to Egypt. Stay in Israel. is going to bless you. He's not going to hurt you. He's going to bless you. I've got my hand on him. But, if you say, we will not dwell in this land, disobeying the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, but we will go to the land of Egypt, where we'll see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor be hungry for bread, and there we will dwell. Then hear now the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. If you wholly set your faces to enter Egypt and go to dwell there, then it shall be that the sword which you feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine of which you were afraid shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there you shall die. So shall it be with all the men who set their faces to go to Egypt to dwell there. They will die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence, and none of them shall remain or escape from the disaster that I'll bring upon them. Is that pretty clear? You stay here, I'm going to bless you. You go to Egypt, you're going to die. They asked God for the wisdom, didn't they? Did God give it? Did He give it liberally? Did He give it without scorning them? Yeah. Chapter 43, verse 1. Now it happened... When Jeremiah had stopped speaking to all the people, all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them all these words, that Azariah the son of Hoshiah, Johanan the son of Kareah, and all the proud men spoke, saying to Jeremiah, You speak falsely. Jeremiah, you're a liar. The Lord our God has not sent you to say, do not go to Egypt to dwell there. Baruch the son of Neriah set you against us to deliver us in the hand of the Chaldeans that they may put us to death or carry us away captive to Babylon. So Johanan son of Korea, 
all the captains of the forces, all the people would not obey the voice of the Lord to remain in the land of Judah. But Johanan, the son of Korah, and all the captains of the forces took all the remnant of Judah and returned to dwell in the land of Judah. And from all the nations where they had been driven, men, women, children, the king's daughters, every person whom Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of the guard had left with Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan. And they took Jeremiah the prophet and Baruch, the son of Neriah, Jeremiah's scribe. So they went to the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of the Lord, and they went as far as Toponies. Now when you go into Egypt from the east, the first great city you come to is Toponies. It was like a second capital for Pharaoh. He has a royal palace there. Outside that royal palace was this huge pavement of stones, patio, pavement of stones. And there were thousands of people would gather on that plaza, that pavement of stones, and he would give speeches. So chapter 43 and 44 tell us that when the children of Israel came to Toponese, God spoke to Jeremiah. Here's what he told him. He said, Jeremiah, go out anywhere you want in that big pavement of stones and dig up one of those huge tiles and move it over out of the way and dig down underneath that a big hole and then get these big boulders and put those boulders in that hole and then put those tiles, smooth it out and replace the tiles that you moved and let Johanan and all those people see where you bury those stones. And after you've done it, tell them this. I'm sending Nebuchadnezzar to Egypt. And he's going to conquer Egypt. And he's going to bring his traveling throne. And he's going to set it on this plaza, but not just anywhere. He's going to set his throne where you buried those boulders. And then he's going to execute the people that called me a liar and called you a liar because they asked for my wisdom, but they refused to obey. Aren't you glad you're a Christian? Aren't you glad we don't live under the old covenant? (laughs) Aren't you glad that we can ask God for wisdom and He'll give it to us if we ask in faith? But remember this. If He gives you the wisdom, He expects you to obey it. Amen? Can you use this in your life? Is this something that there are times in all of our lives where we need to ask God for wisdom? That's how you do it. Amen? Would you stand? I don't know if there's a public commitment needs to be made tonight or not. Whatever God's Spirit might be leading. You just come obey the Lord. If there's somebody here that's lost, you need to be saved tonight. You're with friends. God loves you. And if you need to be saved, you come. Christian, if God leads you to make a commitment, you come obey the Lord, whatever it might be. Thank you for letting me come be with you. It's my joy. Let's pray, then we'll sing. Father, we come. We thank you. There's never a problem that's too hard for you to solve. There's never a situation that you don't know what we ought to do. Lord, we trust you. Help us, Lord, to humble ourselves before your wisdom and your will and your ways. 
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.